a lot of people really liked the the live event that Dave Gerhard and I did. It was probably like a month ago now. We did a live, had great attendance from um, not only the U.S., but also a lot of people in Europe because it was at a European-friendly time. They're not able to make this one. And so um, we got so much great feedback that Dave and I have decided to team up and do this on a recurring basis. Ideally, somewhere on monthly, but we're, he's, a, he's a busy guy over there getting results, so we're going to have to work around his schedule. But the first one is locked in, and so we'll announce that here if you want to pencil it into your calendar. Maybe Angelica can slide in a little registration link so that people can be the first movers here. Um, we did have about, I think we only have a thousand person women and we did have about 800 people register for the last one. So if you do want to come, I would recommend that you register the date on that is Thursday, April 1st at 12 PM Eastern, 12 to one. And so keep an eye out for that. Um, would love to see all of you, all of you there. And so we are. Stepping up, expanding out of the Just Demand Gen Live. I know we love this group here. That's why we keep doing it. Love having you all here live. Um, but also working on a couple of other type of content pillars that happen during regular business hours. So let's, uh, let's get into the agenda. I'm sure a lot of people came here for the SaaS teardown. I'm not going to make you wait that long for it. So no worries. That's going to happen relatively soon. But there is a topic that um, I want to cover first just to get stuff started. And that's the second one on the agenda. The topic is what complacency, what complacency looks like in your marketing strategy and how to avoid it. Um, I see this a lot. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples because this, this translates to marketing, but, and I don't mean to get philosophical, but this also translates to life. Right. And so like in a marketing example, our business is growing. Things are going great. We've been doing this show for a year. I come here on Tuesday nights and I love doing it, but maybe another person that was doing it like me would be like, you know, our business is good. I don't really feel like doing this anymore. Let's just scrap it. Like our, our podcast is doing okay. And that is a form of complacency. And when you start to become complacent, Oddly enough, like the snowball starts rolling down the hill. You cheat on this thing, then you cheat on that thing, then you miss on this thing. And over time, you're going to feel it in your results. Um, I'll give you another example that's for life. A lot of people know that I like to run. Um, I um, like to run so much and I'm committed to trying to progress that I run when it's snowing outside because I need to get the run in. And there are a lot of people that take the winter off. And I talked to talk to somebody that runs competitively um, that hasn't run all winter because the winter this year from January to March right now has been very harsh in Boston. And then they went out there and they tried to run 13 miles and they only got to six and they couldn't do it anymore. And so um, that's another form of, of complacency, having discipline to do the things that you know you need to do in order to be successful. Now let's get into the SaaS part of it now that we covered a couple of like more uh, elementary examples. When, when you are executing a marketing mix and you're putting $2 million of qualified pipeline in, inside every month through your website, and I'm not talking about like you're a 300 million ARR company and you're doing nothing in marketing and people find you because you're a 300 million dollar company and therefore you just get that pipeline like you're out there earning it you're doing a podcast you have a media mix whatever those things are if you start slipping on those things the results will go down and I and I'll, I think for a lot of people it starts to feel a little bit monotonous like I think some people if they were me might think that coming and showing up here and talking every week might be monotonous, right? Like it's source of, we have repeating themes. Like you need to enjoy the process, consider it an endless pursuit, like look at it in that way, because if it feels like a tax on you, then you're eventually going to stop. And when you stop or slow down or change strategies or do those things, the results might follow. And so I just want to encourage people, especially people that have maybe been doing some of the things that we've been talking about and having success, or maybe they've been doing some of the things that we've been talking about and have not yet felt that like meaningful spark. Like sometimes it takes some time. It's based on 
it's based on a lot of different factors about what at what point you have success, but you need to be able to do the right activities for a sustained period of time because you enjoy them and you know what you're working toward. And so um, I thought that was a little bit of a cool place to get started. I'm not sure there's any questions, Spark. Maybe some people got uh, a question or two would be happy to take them. Otherwise, we'll get into uh, what some people might consider the main event. Yeah, I think people are excited for, for the main event. Cool, Let's cool, cool. It. So let's do it, people. We are going to screen share. For the people on the podcast listening, I'm not sure whether or not we're going to include this in the podcast because it would be pretty hard for you to know what's going on. Um, but we are going to look at this company called uh, Procurify. And so we got, their, we got their website here. When I'm doing a teardown, I'm going to walk you through this. The first thing I'm going to try and look at, because I don't have a lot of data about what this company is doing. I don't know really what their product costs. I'm not sure exactly who they're targeting. I don't know if they're running ads or organic or different things like that. So typically the first thing I'm going to do, at least I've been doing this lately, is go to Crunchbase and see what's going on with them. So now we're in Crunchbase. We're seeing, okay, looks like they... Made an acquisition, 51 to 100 employees, Series B. Sometimes that stuff is not 100% accurate. If I was going for employee account, I would use LinkedIn. Um, but the main thing I'm looking for is funding. So Series B 2019, 26 million Canadian, which is about 18 million USD. Okay, so now we have a sense, Series B, 100 employees, um, gives me a sense about sort of like where they're at. Now let's figure out the next thing I'm going to look at is who are they, who do we think they're trying to sell to here? And so maybe customers would work. Let's do that. I mean, you can kind of sort to start to figure out with, uh, with the messaging, but let's see. Okay. So they have it separated by industries. I'm more looking for persona, give your teams the right control to move your business forward. Okay. So this looks like almost like, a. Um, could it be like a concur expense type of competitor, something like that potentially? Um, but I would assume that they're selling into some type of finance function, which is great because we really know how to get into the finance department over here at Refine Lab. So that's cool. Um, I'm not going to watch a demo while everyone's on here, but that gives me a sense about what they're trying to do. Now let's um, next thing, I'm going to look at their requested demo. They put a phone number here. That's nice. Not every SaaS company does that. Sometimes you call though and nobody answers. So now I'm going to look at their demo. Pretty easy form. I imagine that they're using enrichment after that. Otherwise, they're not going to really know whether or not their leads are good. So either they should have more fields or maybe they have Clearbit or they have Zoom info on the back end or some other type of enrichment platform so they can pull the work email and then pull all the other stuff, which is, I assume is what they're doing. Cool, form, short, um, CTA above the fold. Those are things that I like. Now we're going to go over to SEM Rush. And so in SEM Rush, I'm going to drop the domain in here. Let's get a sense of what their traffic is. Okay, got it knock down all these people coming in here. Okay, so main US, that makes sense. Mm, organic keywords, okay, procurement, procurement definition. They got some good positions there and like very broad stuff. Just a note here on some of this, these things for people that focus a lot on SEO, like what is procurement is not a very good topic for someone to buy this product. I'm, it's great that they're getting number one. It's great that they estimate that they're getting 5,400 website visitors a month. It's great that they're not spending $4.86 on a click on Google AdWords. And, but what is procurement is probably not a search that their buyer makes because they're most likely in procurement and they know what procurement means. Just a little note there. There's a lot, I see a lot of SEO built around ranking for terms that your buyers would never search. Okay. Top pay keywords. Let's look at this. Let's 
So let this load up here with a little bit of screen share action. Um, I have not trusted this traffic cost lately. Um, it's been, we've run it on companies where I know how much they're spending because I do it and it's not right. So I would imagine that this is wrong. Um, and let's see what we got here. Purchase order, template Excel, QuickBooks purchase order. So what I'm gonna do here and, and to look at, what I'm trying to figure out is, is their like sort of keyword strategy. I'm gonna start looking for term like keyword terms that would indicate that someone wants to buy stuff. Purchase order software free, typically I'll negative keyword out free if the product isn't free, there's free here. Software purchase order format. So they actually do cover a lot of, um, they cover a lot of software keywords, which is good. No pricing keywords. Uh, vendor. Vendor invoice management system platform. Like these are the types of things like no, no platform for this, like procurement platform. Uh, you know, something like that is there's probably some gold in there to hit. So anyway, I searched those terms to get a sense of what the overall like keyword strategy is and I want to get back to normal because there's a lot of keywords in here that they're wasting money on how to make a purchase order in Excel like if this uh, I don't trust SEMrush enough to like make hard statements here but if they're paying two dollars and 86 cents a click for how to make purchase order how to make a purchase order in Excel like those are people that are actively trying not to buy your stuff and so there's just like a I find, I find in Google ads, people take a lot of liberties on keywords because they either go broad match or they try and like expand out and drive people into mid funnel offers like a, an ebook that they waste somewhere between 30 and several hundred thousand dollars a month that would be better spent in a ton of different ways and just focusing their Google ads on places where people actually have buying intent declared through the keyword search. And it's very easy to tell when people are in buy mode just based on the keywords that they search if you understand your buyer. Um, be interested to see what competitors are doing. Mm, not a lot here. That's cool. So that's what we got to, that's what we get in SEMrush. Now what I'm going to do, oops, i going to move, get the zoom thing out of the way for a second here. I don't think you see it, but it's in my way. I'm going to go to procurement software. Let's see what's going on in the, in the wild in Google. Okay. So, so Captera buys one software one. Okay. So they're not in procurement software, but they do rank number two organically. Let me get a keyword. That's definitely what they do. purchasing software your team actually wants to use. Give me a good one here. Let's just do Procurify. Okay, so they have the number one spot. Nobody else is bidding on their stuff. And there, here we go. Spend managing procurement software. That's perfect. Let's see what happens here. And they don't bid on that term, which is like, so that spend management and procurement software has to be like, they use it in their H1 on their homepage. It has to be like one of their number one terms and they're not showing up in Google for it. So um, that's an interesting learning. We already did procurement software. Let's just do spend management software. Uh, Coupa, which I assume is a competitor, Concur, which I mentioned at the beginning. So what I'm seeing here is basically like all the terms that I would say, I'm not a procurement person, so I can't speak, but like just using logical sense, I just searched spend management software, procurement software, variations of that, and never got a Google ad for them. Um, and I imagine that they're spending quite a bit of money on Google ads. So there's something that's missing there. Um, because these are top terms. Okay. Let's start making some assessments on LinkedIn now. We'll check, we'll do organic and then we'll do paid. So 
So here we go. Make spending simple. Help finance accounting operation teams. Da, 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 da. Series B posts. So if anyone doesn't know, um, if you go to any company's LinkedIn page and then you click on posts, you can click on ads and you can see anybody's ads that are being run and you can see what they're trying to do. But let's go back to organic real quick just so people can see. Um, so 5,300 followers, a little bit of engagement. It's always nice to check because a lot of companies get a ton of engagement, but it's all their employees, which about it looks like 50% are. Um, but the uh, despite the lack of engagement, I think that the, the content organically is better than what I've seen from a lot of other SaaS companies. Like we have an audiogram, we got this person, you know, SoftBank's VC CFO, um, some good content. I would put captions in here because a lot of people are going to watch it with the audio off, like what I'm doing right now. Um, some good stuff, links in the post as a no, no, but I would say they're in general, they're not doing too bad. One of the things that I recommend and you notice in my posts is that I'm, I'm not sharing other people's stuff. Um, I'm focused on original content. And so that's something that I would, I would consider here. Now let's move into the ads, which is probably what a lot of people came for. So we're going to scroll through here. And what we're going to see is the standard SaaS agency playbook for LinkedIn ads. So we have an ebook for spend management where you download and they actually send you to a landing page. So their, their cost per lead must be high here. What people will do is they'll use a lead gen form on LinkedIn to make the cost lower. Um, but when you send them to a landing page, what we find in our data is the cost per lead is somewhere between two and 10 times higher, depending on how good the landing page is. Yeah, you get work email. Yeah, you get a couple of extra fields, but it's not, in my view, worth the cost because when it comes down to it, you're collecting an email address here and you're spending a lot of money for it. And so what I would do is I would get into their CRM and I would look if they were using UTMs, you'd be able to look at every person that downloaded this ebook and then what happened to them over the next 12 months of whether or not they actually got into an opportunity, whether they bought something, all those different things, compare it against the spend, against the revenue generated. And what we always find is that this strategy simply does not work. If you are measuring your success on leads, you're going to have success. If you're Salesforce and you're doing this shit, you're going to have success because you claim attribution on enough people and eventually someone will buy. But if you're a 12 million ARR SaaS company, the strategy is not going to work for you, at least if you care about CAC payback. And so we go through here. Okay, we have one here that's not a um, not an ebook, so it looks like it's complex. I I I think the creative is edgy. Like I I like for trying out something differently. Um, but don't see much on the landing page. No, I got to wait for this thing to move so I can get back to what I'm doing. So that's what we got on LinkedIn. In, in general, like just the, the LinkedIn mid funnel content download game is not a, is, is not a good place to be. Um, I am not, I don't remember exactly the link to where I can see people's ads, uh, on Facebook and Instagram. So a lot of SaaS companies don't run anything on Facebook and Instagram. Um, let's see if I can find this stuff. If somebody knows it, you can drop the link in the, if there's a specific link to look at this stuff, if you could drop it in the chat, that would be awesome. Eric got you, if you wanna jump in there. Thanks, Eric, one second. My man. Eric to the rescue. Yeah, <laughs> cool, let's do this. Uh, let me get back to screen sharing. Cool. Search by Procurify. Got them. 
Okay. So, and they're not running anything on, um, not running anything on Facebook and Instagram, at least what this can see. Um, and let me just all say, ads. Yeah. There we go. All ads. Okay. So they do have some stuff. It's the, about the same strategy as what we saw on LinkedIn, except there was some direct response went for demos and things like that. Um, unless you have like enrichment software post conversion, which a lot of people will, um, just the overall data you're going to get on a lead gen ad from Facebook is bad. You're also going to get people that don't have a lot of buying intent. And so like, um, people know my position on, on this one. So I talk about it enough on the podcast, but the, the missing piece here in conversion based paid social expecting people to become customers is that they were just scrolling through their Instagram feed. They weren't, they weren't looking to get a demo of still interested in purchase order software and then try and get all of their people on board when they already use a different tool. And there, there's just not enough buying intent for people to complete this at a rate that makes sense. And so what I would change here is instead of having them, let's just click on this one and see what happens. I want this demo. Okay. So they get, it's a seven second, like kind of video that says a free demo, but I like, let's just say I'm interested and I want to see it. Okay. So then I got to fill out a form and I got to get followed up with, I've done this before as a consumer, by the way. So as a consumer, the exact behavior, oh, like this stuff looks cool. Learn more, click on it, fill out the form on my, on my phone, because 99% of people are going to be on their phone, fill it out. And then three days later, get hit with an SDR because I spend a, a lot of the time that I'm on Instagram is on the weekend, get hit with an SDR on Tuesday. And by then I've completely forgotten about that. I'm ever interested and you just get, you just get no responses. And so what I would do instead is why wouldn't you just have the demo video and then put it in and show people that, or why wouldn't you spend, spend enough time creating this like little video? Like, why wouldn't you just help people understand more about the product inside the feed? We've been getting way, way more aggressive in the idea of, of not expecting people to click and trying to tell a complete story inside of the feed, whether that's through copy, whether that's through a video, whether that's through an animation, just switching it out in your mind. If you, if the first step is you have to get out of conversion mode, like I need to get a lead out of this ad spend, at least a direct response lead, like we measured in a different way. So if you can move your head around the idea that, okay, like I don't need a lead from this, so I don't need to run conversion ads. So now I have a chance because I know how to target CFOs on, on Facebook and Instagram that why wouldn't I just try and tell them a story in a 30 second video or a minute video or a seven minute video or a seven second GIF or a static image with a lot of thoughtful copy about what they want, what we're trying to say to them. And so just by switching your mindset on this goes for Facebook, this goes for Instagram, this goes for LinkedIn, it applies across the board on paid social channels. We've moved to this strategy. We measure down funnel demo conversions that are influenced by these ads as opposed to direct response. The conversion rates are way better. Yes, I know your cost per lead is higher, but because the conversion rates are way better, it offsets it by a lot. Um, estimating here somewhere between three and 10 times um, better on ter in terms of overall customer acquisition cost, because I know that you're getting $50 leads, but when you look downstream, most, I would say two to 3% actually even make it to an SQL. That's what people build their models around. Um, and so to collect a hundred leads, to churn through them with SDRs, to get two SQLs is just terribly inefficient in my view, especially when the people that download these eBooks oftentimes don't read them. So if you use like PDF, some type of PDF analytics, or if they download this guide on a lead gen form, and then you have to push it into your marketing automation system and send them a confirmation email with the PDF in it. If you track what the click-through rate of that, the click-through rate of the confirmation email is, it's going to be 10% or less. So that means that everyone that filled out this form, only one in 10 even have a chance to consume the ebook. And so that's something to think about as well. So when you, if you, if you're looking at content consumption, you should look at that metric, which will illuminate that. I guess a lot of people aren't even really consuming this ebook that we're putting forward. I've done this a ton of times over the past five years. The first time I did it, I was amazed. 
when I measured and I was like, we're running this thing and only, only one out of 10 people have a shot of even reading this because they're clicking through the email. And so um, that's something to think about as well. And so if you're like, okay, well, I guess people aren't consuming the content and you admit that to yourself, then you end up with, okay, I'm paying somewhere between 20 and $200 to get someone's email address. So we're critiquing uh, the creative in the chat. Do you have a creative teardown? <laughs> um, on, the, on the creative tear, it's tough to be, it's, it's tough to make a creative teardown on this because before it, before we can talk about creative, you have to align on objective, right? Like there's nothing that we can do creatively to make this ebook ad work better because it's the objective that's wrong. Um, and so like aesthetically, does it look okay? Sure. But that's, it's like my subjective opinion on that. It's really the, um, it's really the objective that's missing. And now like I can come in here and tear down creative and say, Hey, this thing doesn't look good or this thing is better. But if you just run a bunch of different variations of creative, which I do all the time, I have a deep level of respect that I have no idea which ones are going to work. Some of the things that I think are the worst looking perform the best. And so I just, I have my subjective opinion on it. I'm going to like let people know, but the data really speaks. And then I use the data to inform my insights, develop a hypothesis as to why or why it didn't work, and then pass that back along so we can keep getting better. Um, Omar had a thought in terms of storytelling and framework, how do you look at that when it comes to the copy on the post? Love the thought around telling a story and not focus, not focusing on conversion. Yeah, so I mean, you basically have your shot to if you know how to, if you can figure out how to target LinkedIn, it's super simple. Um, Facebook, it's a little bit more, more complex, but there's plenty of ways to do it. You basically have your shot to as often as possible, say the things that you want to people in ways that they pay attention. And so like we have some where we have um, like a high production video that's showing a story of this, you know, person that was struggling with blah, blah, blah. I just don't want to talk about like certain company things that we companies that we work with. So struggling with this type of thing. And you literally have like a, it's almost like a television commercial, but put together in a little bit better of a way that tells a story. So um, you could do something like that. You could, if you want to do a low lift, which I recommend at the beginning, just to sort of like scrape your knees and figure it out, then something like, um, a value proposition or a strategic narrative kind of old way, new way, or even just like um, kind of communicating against a pain point of something dumb that people do that they don't need to do anymore because there's an easy solution for it that you have. And so those are some options you, and that can be inserted in the overall creative. Facebook and Instagram used to have text limits where you can only use 20% of the graphic to have text in it. They're not enforcing that. I believe that it's actually been completely gone away at least for the past 12 months. And so you can use the whole thing with, with text, if you wanted to tell a story, um, the headline is really important. So if, in order of importance, this is one thing that I can give you. The actual picture or video is the most important to whether or not the ad is successful. The next thing is the headline. And so I'll show you the headline just so everyone has it. The headline is this, it looks different in the feed. So it would show the complete guide to spend management in 2021. That's the headline and it would look different in a feed than where it looks here. That's the second most important. And the third most important is this copy. And so um, you, you have a lot of opportunities creatively to tell it. You can be very direct value proposition, different things like that. Like you can be very, um, very creative. Like um, I've been really interested in some of the stuff that uh, some of the logistics providers have been doing lately, like a FedEx or something like that about like how, like what FedEx does is actually get like a, um, a replacement heart delivered in the right amount of time to the patient that needs it so that they can um, get a heart transplant. Like that story is cool. And you're taking like a boring shipping company and, uh, and making it a bit more emotional, more exciting, more, more like that. And so I think you have a ton of of flexibility on what you could do there. All right, happy to answer a follow up question, Omar, if you want to get a little bit more specific. I can bring you on, Omar. 
Oh, perfect. Can you guys can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're in. What's up, man? Yeah. Is this your first time here? Great to have you here. This is my this is my second time here, and I have to give you a little shout out, Chris. I I was inspired by your videos for you know all this time, and I decided I was like, you know, I should be making these videos. So I'm not gonna lie, I did a Chris Walker video earlier this week uh, for <laughs> for the med tech world, and what and I'm and someone messaged like, haven't I seen this before? I'm like, yeah, Chris Walker does the same thing. I I did I just ripped it off from him. I'm not gonna lie. So yeah, big fan. That's of awesome, man. Love on. that. Yeah, 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 the med tech thing. world, the med tech world needs someone like you. You God, should do it. it. Sucks. But you see, you're smarter <laughs> than me because you got out like a few years before I got. I, out. I had to. There's no, <laughs> no other option. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, you know, I guess my question is, you know, especially with with the iOS 14 update, which doesn't really affect LinkedIn, thank God, but it's putting more of an emphasis on what you're actually putting in terms of copy. And I'm trying to get better about figuring out like what's a good framework to to put it around. Like, you know, the simple one is like here's a problem, here's, here's the, tr you know, trial and tribulation, here's a solution. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything that, 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 that works? And, and I hate to ask for like, kind of like a, a quick tactic, but just, you know, a little bit more like, cl you know, clarity on, on, on when you talk about that, that post content, which you mean in terms of a story framework. Mm -hmm. Paid, right? Yes. Paid. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, let's do it. So let's pretend that uh, we work at a company that sells a, uh, a, a ventilator. And this specific ventilator has something where people that have this specific condition um, do way better on this ventilator. And it's a really important condition for the ICU. Okay, so whatever, whatever that is, you could put together a, a story from a patient that went through it or the story of the patient's family and pull it together about, you know what I mean? Like, I just think that there's a lot of creative flexibility that a lot of tech companies don't use. Um, and I, I'm not sure why I'm not sure if it's because they believe that it's just dollars in dollars out ads conversion. I maybe that they don't respect creative enough. Maybe that they don't think about things in the way that I do yet. Um, but I like, if, if we're going to move to video, you basically have, two options, like hit hard with the product or tell a, a story about an outcome that was used with the product. That's way less, that's more emotional and way less value driven. And so I think in the med tech world, there's a ton of opportunities to do that stuff. Um, I totally agree. But now I, like I've actually just in the last month, so now I'm in SAS still in ooh, healthcare though. But yeah. yes, this is the, this is the uh, dynamic that I'm faced with, which is do I, do I go lead with like a personal story of let's say uh, the person who would be using the software, right? Which is mm -hmm. not as recognizable because if you're scrolling through a feed, it just looks like another human being. Mm -hmm. Or do I take the risk of focusing more on the product or the software side where it's not as personal and not, I don't think the story is as strong, but at least if going through a feed, someone will recognize a feature in a software and be like, oh, that's something that I use. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know if there's a right answer to that, but just kind of throwing. Yeah. What I was going to ask you back is why can't you do both? I agree. You should definitely do both, but it just in your, in your experience, I mean, if you had to pick. Um, there, it honestly depends on the execution, right? Like it, 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 I think either one can work. Um, it really depends on what, what you put in front of people. So I recommend like, um, we recommend people start with easy things, simple graphic designs, different things like that to sort of like uh, eliminate variables before you move to like something that's high production where you're going to invest a lot of money where if you swing and miss, it would hurt. And so like, um, static images, can we just like do, are we getting to the right people, right? Like with this value proposition are people clicking on it? Is somebody converting? Do they have the right job title? Could they actually buy something from us? Like validate the audience first, especially on Facebook, on LinkedIn, it's a way more clean, but on Facebook, people will get like, these metrics of like 14 cents per click and their targeting's terrible and they're just getting clicks through the algorithm. You know what I mean? Um, and so I like sort of starting small and then working up to those things, unless there is an existing asset where it's already done. Like I've walked into companies where they have 10 killer videos and I'm like, let's roll. Um, so that's sort of the, the approach. Um, I don't, uh, who's the buyer inside of healthcare? Is it like a procurement or is it like a physician or something? Yeah, so technically both. So we sell a SaaS, we have a SaaS platform for private medical practices. Mm -hmm. And so the decision maker ends up being the practice owner. So in this case, usually the physician or cl clinician, whoever it might be. But the user is going to be someone who's like a practice manager, or an office manager, or, mm -hmm. or a billing specialist, right? You know, right now, I've created more content around the decision maker, just because I don't have product, con product marketing content yet, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I think something that you pointed out, which I never thought of, uh, and correct me if this is the right order, that when you said, when you were looking at those ads, you said that in order of importance, copy that's within the ad image, followed by copy in the, I think the headline below. The headline, and, which sits and, below, and, and the, the copy third. at the top. Yeah, and just so I understand, is that because if, if you have something compelling enough to get attention and drive an action, the next step that someone likely will look at is that headline below and just to convert them over. Cause if it's long copy up top, it's likely that they're not going to like finish reading that and actually take the action. It's just um, through a, an absolute ton of tests and testing a lot of variables, just seeing which ones make the most movement to the outcome. And if you think about it logically, it's like I'm scrolling through a feed. Like the first thing I'm going to look at is the graphic and decide whether I'm going to keep scrolling or whether I'm keep going. And let's just say it's interesting then Next, I'll look at the next biggest text, which sits directly under it. And then I might actually have to scroll up a little bit to see the copy on top. And so that's sort of like my logical sort of hypothesis around it. But the, when I've run enough tests on the data, it's very clear that that's the order of, of how it works. Um, and so when you think about the overall like things, I'm just going to give other people, it's for you, but other people will get ideas from this too. Like you could run a, a round table like video for seven minutes on Facebook. Like you could go thought leadership angle for sure. Thought leadership, like just the video, no CTA, nothing. Like my goal is that you watch this video, right? Um, user stories, user story, patient story, um, product explainer, product video, emotional or value proposition. Um, there's just tons of different directions once you start to open, open it up. So um, I encourage people to try them all because when we go and work with customers, we literally try them all and we get different results on each one, depending on the buyer, the company, the targeting, the quality, some, com some customer stories work the best, like better than product ads. Pro some companies like, it's just like, let's go heavy product ads. Not enough people know about the product. We can run this for a while and get a really good outcome. And so it just sort of depends on, on the stage of the company and a lot of the other dynamics. One, one last quick, quick question. Sorry to take Yeah, yeah, no, we're good. This is I'm good to people. Curious, so if, if, you, if you optimize your, you know, some copy on that image, let's say, you know, save tons of money using the software or yep. whatever, yep. whatever that copy is, the next step, right, you said that headline. Do you use that headline to reinforce the message seen on that, on that image? Or do you use that headline to spell out the action you want them to take, <laughs> i.e., you know, you know, download this mm -hmm. right now? Or yeah. So you have the headline option and then you can put a, a button next to it. And so um, we typically have the button say, learn more. And then the, the headline would be like a secondary outcome of the copy or like something like that as a headline catcher. It really depends on what you're running, right? If it's like a PR announcement, I'm going to make it feel very newsy. If it's a customer story, I'm also going to make it feel very newsy. If it's a product that I'm going to probably lean on a value proposition or call out the person I'm going after you know, um, like healthcare leaders win with blah, you know what I mean? Or call out the audience in the creative or other things. And I just like, I sit there and make 20 ads and I test them and I, I'm always surprised at which one works the best. Got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate Happy it. to help, man. Great to see you here. Congrats on the new role. Thank you. Great questions, Omar. Should we roll into some questions that were sent in advance? Um, perhaps if people have any other follow-ups on the SaaS demand teardown, would love to take like contextual questions there too. Uh, Orly, I saw you had a few. Do you want to come on and talk about it? I think you, there was some chatter going on in the chat, but come on. Yeah. On. Hey there. Um, well, that's okay. So I have to say long time listener, first time, uh, Oh, actually attending we, in live. We First hear that every right. week. Great to have you. Well, so, you know, I have to say, Chris, you've been part of my exercise routine for the past couple of weeks. So you and me have been waking up in the morning and uh, hitting the machine. So nice. it's uh, been a good thing. Happy to be there First with time you. First time Zoomer. Right. So <laughs> I, I, this is interesting that, uh, you know, you're tearing down some of the LinkedIn ads because we're just in the process of hiring uh, someone to work on our LinkedIn ads. And I'm trying to figure out you know, some direction in terms of uh, where to um, direct him. If I get you right, right, you're saying uh, put these middle of funnel videos, which we, I think, have some decent quality videos, mm -hmm. and just uh, present it to the audience based on how, what percentage they view, then retarget them with a bottom of funnel ad. How, or how do you kind of 
do that further yeah. narrowing of your audience. Um, how much does your product cost? Um, so I guess the average ticket's about 6,500. And is it non-recurring? No, it rec that's every year. Okay, recurring every year, 6,500. Um, so 6,500 is, is going to be pretty tough unless you're very narrow on who you're going after to make the math work because LinkedIn ads are pretty expensive depending on who you're targeting. And so sometimes in this like sort of like sub 15K range, it can be pretty tight about whether or not like if you just build out the funnel of the whether or not people would actually become a customer and what those might look like in a realistic model, which most people don't build it realistically, it would it might just cost you more money than you're going to get back. And the gap is going to be quite large and it may not be worth running LinkedIn ads unless you're like, I want to just hit the CFOs at these thousand companies. That's it. Um, so something to consider there. Um, but to get to your question on, on the LinkedIn stuff, you can think about it. Like I personally don't think about it like a funnel. I just think about it. Like, um, I have an opportunity to tell some, to tell a story to somebody in a way that hopefully creates a conversation internally, creates a awareness of a problem, creates a brand impression so that they, when they recognize the problem, they think of us that they share it with somebody that might make the decision that they click on it so that they can move into retargeting things on other platforms that are more cost effective. So like, that's sort of what I'm, I'm looking at. Um, the reason that I don't go from a LinkedIn standpoint, this person watched 75% of the video and now I'm going to hit them with a get a demo direct response ad is because the amount of people that can, that fill out that form, people will fill out that form. And if you do it well, you'll get people for 50 bucks. The problem is that you can go and run that test yourself and you'll probably win one in a thousand of the people that fill out that form in a customer. And so you're paying $50 for the lead. You win one in a thousand. Your customer acquisition cost is 50K on ads, excluding all the time that your salespeople are spending on it. And so you're, spe you're spending $65,000 to get 6,500 back. So for companies that are selling super enterprise deals, hundreds of thousands of dollars, they can justify the inefficiencies like th so they can do that i still don't believe in that because i think there's a better way but they can go and say oh yeah like you know we sold a three hundred thousand dollar deal it only cost us seventy five thousand dollars i guess it worked um so that's the that's the danger in thinking about it like a, a direct response funnel inside of paid social is all roads lead to just very low win rates um so i would think about it more of just like what am i trying to say to these people that might help move them along or become more aware of us. And just when I think about this, I just compare it to where else are we spending money to do a similar thing? And is this a more effective way to do it? Right? So like the companies that are spending hundred a hundred thousand dollars on a trade show booth to have a hundred people walk by to get the same five minute pitch and then collect a lead. That was a thousand dollars to give someone that five minute pitch. We can right. do the same five minute pitch on LinkedIn for eight cents. And so if we get someone to actually consume it, and so that's the sort of comparison that I make in terms of overall dollars. Um, so if I get you right, and just to summarize, you would say use LinkedIn for those type of uh, buyers or executives or whoever they are that you couldn't necessarily get by going to Google ads or other type of platforms. Um, yeah, in Google ads, you're, you're hoping that someone searches and finds you and you have no firmographic criteria about whether or not they can buy from you. And so if it can only be companies that are 500 employees and above, but you have an SMB competitor that's taking that market and you don't want to sell to those people and you need to bid on that keyword in Google, you can't distinguish about whether the person works at a 10 person company or a 500 person company. So that's the one, the company firmographic thing is something you can't replicate in Google like you can on LinkedIn. The second thing is it requires someone to actually come and search for you. On LinkedIn, you can just go out and get them. And so it's almost right. like proactive versus reactive in those two channels. Okay, thanks. Cool, great to see you. Thanks for coming, Orly. Hope to see you back. Blake has a teardown related question. I promised I'd bring him on next. Let's keep it going. Blake. Hey, you guys. Hey. How's it going? Hey, hey. Good to see you, I man. Facebook yeah, ads still rocking out. Well, we, we gotta we're gonna make a temporary shift to LinkedIn uh, for for some executive direction, just to, about the audiences. So it's yeah, related I wanna, to my question. I want to give an. I just want to give a note for people. This is like pretty hot off the press. So 
Um, one thing that we've been, that I've been, we actually haven't rolled it out to our whole team because I wanted to make sure that it was going to actually work effectively and move all the way through the funnel, but it appears that it's going to. So I'm going to share it with you and maybe you can try it for yourself. So if you're targeting certain executive buyers and you're running like link click or conversion based ads, then you're going to be paying 80 to $120 CPM, perhaps more, depending on who you're going after. And so one thing that we've done on LinkedIn is that we've started bidding on the brand awareness objective and maximizing delivery in terms of impressions, which has been able to reduce CPMs by somewhere between 25 and 50%. And even though the objective is brand awareness, more people are clicking. So you have better click-through rates and dramatically lower cost per clicks as opposed to just a link click ad. So something to consider if you are running link click ads, there's a there's potentially a better way to do it. You should run them side by side with the same exact creative to the same exact audience and see what happens for you. But we've taken CPMs for some companies from 100 to 50 bucks. And it makes a huge difference when you're spending a lot of money. Cool. Now to your question. Sorry. No, no, no. You're, there. You're, <laughs> no, you're all you're all good. That that's uh that's helpful. Um so that's actually kind of like related. So my question is so yeah, Facebook has been going well. Um, but we're going to take a shift over to LinkedIn, look, targeting the same audience. And the reason is, is our expected audience that we're looking to target, right? We have like 7,000 accounts. And so we're figuring, you know, our audience um, that we'd be able to target on social would be like anywhere from 50,000 to 75,000 people would be looking to get information to mm -hmm. based off that. But um, with the native targeting of like a Facebook, I can only get to about 20,000 with the job titles. And I've tried like every different type of, you know, combination of like, you know, interests, whatever, mm -hmm. trying to get that in there. Have you tried uh, audience expansion on Facebook? The detail no, targeting, I, you should try, detailed tar you should try detailed targeting expansion. Okay. So make sure the pixel is on your site. Mm -hmm. And then once the campaign is warmed up, there's a way you, now you have to click into it inside of Facebook. So it's not like dramatically present inside of the ad set, but underneath in the audience section, you can add, check a box, add detailed targeting expansion. And that'll help you get to more people. Uh, I'm not right. sure if it's going to help you cover the whole thing, but it'll help you get to more. And if you start to use some of these bidding strategies that I just mentioned, and they're successful for you, the CPM differences between Facebook and LinkedIn are not that dramatic anymore. So um, if you can get them to a place where you're paying, you know, $13 CPM or what, let's make it more realistic for some of the custom audiences we use, we're paying $18 CPM on Facebook and we're paying $34 on LinkedIn you get way better targeting on LinkedIn. The problem is for specific audiences, like I'm trying to give an example, um, for specific audiences, you don't get a lot of reach. Like there's a million people that, you're, that your audience is on LinkedIn that have them, but you only reach 90,000 because the other 910,000 never log into LinkedIn. And so that's something to consider as well but let's yeah. keep going. So you have that, you, you can put the account list in or you can get to them, however, for more scale. Yeah, yeah, no, that's super helpful. And that's actually, um, I mean, we're going to like be taking like a pause to see what happens, you know, if like we stop running the ads, see if there's going to be like a drop off because we're having the attribution, um, you know, question, see if there's a drop off in demo requests. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to stop that's everything like, or are you going to just, are you going to, because if you move from Facebook to LinkedIn and you don't, and right, there's no cutoff, that. you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see another thing like when you're advertising like what mm -hmm. we are you might not feel it for two months because mm, people okay. have been seeing the ads for a long time it's not like you shut off the ad and all of a sudden it like everything goes away back to normal right like you've made those impressions for a long time like if i stopped doing this podcast we would still get inbound leads for a period of time it wouldn't stop tomorrow it would mm -hmm. stop eventually and so that's something to consider as well it's it's tough to look at that as like a direct correlation like someone's seen your ad and immediately converted there's probably seen a bunch moving through a buying cycle, going through stuff and then converting. So typically what I would imagine is if you shut off Facebook ads, you would see a slow decline for somewhere between 45 and 90 days to back to normal. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Cause it won't, won't quite be the, you know, one-to-one -one we cut it off. If we move it to LinkedIn, we might not see that drop. Okay. So my recommendation on this, if you were going to mm -hmm. do it is I would go at 50% budget on Facebook carve out a little bit of additional budget and then do what you want on LinkedIn. So you don't just like cut off a strategy. Last time you talked, it was, it was, you felt like it was working. Right. And so I, just I, wouldn't I just still like, do. Yeah. And we're, we're running them too. And we don't get, we've lost like 
almost all attribution. Like we're getting a couple coming through here, but I know that it's being dramatically in, not in, um, I know that it's under reporting by a lot, but mm -hmm. when I go into Salesforce, their demos continue to go up with ICP customers and their, their qualified pipeline continues to go up. And I'm like, I, I know I have clear attribution on LinkedIn and it's not driving all of it. And I'm spending this money on Facebook and three months ago, it was driving 30 demos. And now it's telling me that it's only driving three, but we're still getting the same or more amount of demos. Like I, based on process of elimination, I feel like this is still making an impact, but that's at what it is right now. And we also, I can't report on it right now, but we have a couple of things that we're testing as a way to get around this by looking at the account instead of the persona that you're targeting. So another thing to consider that I'll update in a couple of weeks, but um, so you want to move on to LinkedIn? I'm sure that you had a question, but I keep interrupting you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. No, I mean, you've kind of like basically like covered it. I mean, with like the audience expansion, um, and then, well, I, I guess here's my question from there. So what do you guys do if you have trouble? Like, have you had trouble nailing down an audience on, um, LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, for any of your clients? And like, what do you typically do if you have trouble nailing it down? Um, never on LinkedIn, if they're, mm, you, you know what I mean? Like, mm. it's just, there it is, right? Like you might not be able to get full reach. Like I just mentioned, but like, it's pretty straightforward for anyone that knows who their ICP is, how to target them on LinkedIn. And then we use, we use several tools to um, do the targeting on Facebook. And so like, that's not the, in, that's not an issue either. Um, and so we don't, I've run into it before, like before I had bought these tools and had the budget to do it and different things like that. And yeah, like targeting CFOs natively on Facebook versus targeting them with a tool that's built for B2B Facebook and Instagram targeting is a completely different game completely changed the game when we implemented that last May. And so um, when you, if you run into those challenges, the first question is, is um, if I, am I not getting to everyone that I want or am I getting to the wrong people? Like that's the first thing that you need to figure out. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to, to run some of the stuff that we don't recommend, like run a get a demo ad, run a LinkedIn gated ebook, run a webinar. Webinar is probably the best one because it's just like, they have to fill out it anyway, run a webinar and collect 30 people and see whether those 30 people are someone that would buy from you or not, which will help validate the audience. Um, but to be for several, I used to be so heavy on Facebook, like so heavy because the CPM differences were so high. They're not Facebook CPM prices are going up and LinkedIn ad prices were finding ways to bring them down. And the difference used to be like somewhere between five and 10 X more expensive on LinkedIn. And now it's like two to three. And those, the difference is, is meaningful. So we've been putting more money on LinkedIn. So I, I will tag on one more question to it. Um, yeah. With, with um, what you've been moving over to LinkedIn, like you said, the CPM, you know, the, the cost difference is like, you know, kind of leveling out to an mm -hmm. extent. Mm -hmm. um, are you moving the same execution over from what you've been doing on like Facebook and the same number of variations? Because I think in the past you've talked about like we you go guys. less variations because okay. yeah. um, the, the, way that LinkedIn optimizes is different. So we like in an ideal setting, if we're going to run like product marketing or different things like that, we're going to run a lot of variations on Facebook and then we're going to take the several best and then we're going to potentially iterate on them again. And then we're going to run those on LinkedIn. Um, and then another thing is that we, we stay in lower in the, in the quote unquote funnel on LinkedIn. And so like typically case studies down, or if somebody actually has good organic content that like, is like mine on LinkedIn or they do round tables or if they have good like thought leadership content that's not pushing product, I would love to start doing more of that on, on LinkedIn. But the challenge is that that type of stuff only works if it's really good, right? Like if you're running an ad with shitty thought leadership content, it is not going to work. Um, so that's sort of like, that's sort of what we do. Um, the, I, I would play around with it. Like we've, we've done product videos, uh, customer stories, a lot of blogs are just like, it's just not, uh, no matter what the outcome is, like we have, I'll, I'll do this for you and we can report back in a couple of weeks. Um, we had one um, problem awareness blog on Facebook that drove like 50 demos. Okay. Um, it was like, it was the best performing campaign that I've, I, maybe that I've ever run on Facebook, at least since I've run this company. And it was not a product. It had nothing to do with their product. And it was just in incredible at the efficiency and the cost for a top of funnel type of thing like that. I'll bring that over to LinkedIn and see what happens. And I'll report back to you on that um, because 
maybe there's a maybe the last time I tested that I just like didn't have it exactly right. And maybe there is a way to make something like that work there. So I think that's the the best next step. But um, I, I guess in short, I wouldn't directly copy them over. Okay. Um, but you can use a lot of the learnings from Facebook in a less expensive place to inform what you're doing on LinkedIn. Awesome. Perfect. Cool. Re appreciate it. Really helpful. Chris. Always Thanks. happy Thanks, to help, man. man. Um, another, uh, another note for people on LinkedIn. It was, I don't know, like, uh, it was, it was recent that LinkedIn finally allows square images if you want to run ads. And so if you want to run ads on LinkedIn, stop making the landscape format in that weird aspect ratio that nobody uses except for LinkedIn. And you can just use a square. And when most people are on mobile, the square is going to take up more of the vertical screen size when they're scrolling than that image, and it's going to work better. So that's a pro tip for anyone. Um, start using square images on LinkedIn ads. It's Bob time. He has a LinkedIn question. Cool. So we're just going to keep it going. Hey, um, Chris. Hey, Appreciate hey. It. So yeah, you actually hit on, hit on the one thing, Chris, where I'm going to try uh, switching up the brand awareness. I just initiated a new ad today on LinkedIn after having tried like a little test a month or so ago and it wasn't really worthwhile. But what we're doing is on a sales led motion, my team is gonna start um, calling on key accounts. So there's like a top 50 list of optical retailers, like mm -hmm. big brands, you know, yep. like Costco wholesale, things like that. The list. So I, I created a key account target list in you know all those um, companies within the audience. And then from there, I had a question for you about targeting. Um, you can do the job title function, which it wasn't very specific at the C level. I had like kind of specific C level job titles I was looking for, but it was just bundled under like CXO. And I was mm -hmm. assuming that that was just the generic for all the C level, or is that, am I wrong on that? Like I thought that included CFO, CEO, you know, all C level titles in that CXO designation because there was no VP level like yeah you know, so you have you got two out. options here you have job title which is like the exact job title I think LinkedIn's algorithm probably buckets them into logical groups even if there's small differences I don't know for sure but that's why I assume what's happening or you have seniority um, and so you can't use them together because they would override one another right so if you had like chief marketing officer but you only wanted to target VPs they would get in the way of each other so you can't use them in parallel so you actually have to pick one. What I would recommend for you to do here is to upload the list. So you can upload the list, whether it's from domain URL, that what they what they have, or you can um, domain URL or LinkedIn um, company page URL, either one can work. And so you can go in and you can get those exact companies. And then because it's only 50 companies, I would just target everyone, either VP and up or CX, CXO, like whatever you think is is most appropriate knowing that you're going to hit a couple of people that may not be exactly who you want, but they're at least if they ever have a conversation about whether or not to use you, the CIO knows who you are, has seen your company once or twice is sort of the way that I look at it. So are you wasting a couple cents every time you give someone that ad? Yeah, but it's a couple cents. I, I guess what I used here was job seniorities and I included CXO, director, manager, owner, partner, and VP. Yeah. And then, and then there was, I also added or job functions and had in like a number. It's going to be too, it's going to get too big in that case. Like, unless you want to hit everyone at that, like what you just put out there, the ads will deliver to everyone at that company. Yeah, it was a uh, hundred. The target audience was 130,000. Yeah. And the C, you, you peg the CPM. It's, it's, I, you know, I just started running it today at like $50 a day. And so it hit a, uh, you know, it was at a um, $80 CPM on 800 mm -hmm. impressions. The view, I had a question for you about like the views and, you know, and, and I was doing a website. Yeah, one sec. I want to, I want to give you something for, for you, but also for everyone, something that I've been using a lot more lately, especially when you're using seniority targeting on LinkedIn, like what you are, is that if you, you can check the box of the campaign that you're running. And then in the top above that, there's going to be three blue buttons, I think. And one of them says demographics and click on the button in demographics. And it's going to show you all the data about who is actually seeing the ads. Okay. And so you can go in there and there's a drop down and it's going to start with job function because LinkedIn LinkedIn's hiding that and you want to click on job title. And so you can click on job title and it's going to show you how the impressions are split out by the job title, what the click through percentages are by job title. And then if you have enough data, but it's you have to spend a lot to have meaningful data on there, it would show you conversion rates. 
Um, but the important thing is the it, just the impressions. And you can go in there and look and be like, oh, we've gone in there and we've been using like, um, we've inherited other accounts that use seniority targeting, function marketing, seniority manager, um, blah, 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 blah. And you go in there and like most of the ads are going to like business development reps and stuff like that. And so when you use function, when you use seniority or function targeting, LinkedIn has a lot of space to give ads to people that are probably not your buyer. And so you can go and check that um, in the demographics. And then if you wanted to back out of it, you could go to the demographics look and be like, okay, these four people I don't want to give ads to. And then you can go to exclusions and you can exclude those ads. You can exclude those job posts. You can work backwards instead of by including them. You can just exclude, you can build a big list and exclude people you don't want. Either way works, but it's easy enough to build it the right way based on inclusion. So I'd recommend just doing that. In terms of message delivery, so for example, if you had, you know, I, you know, I'll just give you the numbers. There was like 800 impressions and 200 views, and then you know it starts showing you by view percentage, 25% and 50%. Mm -hmm. The numbers start to get pretty anemic pretty quickly. So for example, you know, at like you know 25%, it was like 40 views out of the 200, which you know at 25, it was like a one minute video. So I'm actually okay with that message delivery for the cost because it's just it's about you know telling that story. It's a little 40 second, you know, video, uh, mm -hmm. video of our story. So I was okay with that. But in terms of like, what, what are your expectations if you run an ad in terms of video consumption off of uh, impressions? Mm, it's, what are you happy with? Um, I don't think that there's a black and white number for this. So what I do is that I have my conversion metrics downstream that I'm looking for. So I'm looking at how many, like the ultimate thing is I spent a thousand dollars. How many people that saw this ad filled out a demo form within my attribution window on LinkedIn. I'm so not even running that. To be honest with <clears> so that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for initially. And then if I'm in my cost target, the rest of it is just informing or learnings for the next piece of creative, which is ideal. Or if I miss, then I start to look at why. And so then I'm going to go into the view. Like um, I'm not exactly, there's a ton of metrics in LinkedIn. So I'm not exactly sure what metric you're looking for here, but like in terms of video, um, video completion rate, um, I think, like th somewhere between three and 10% would be fine. And I think there's a different metric called view rate. And don't quote me on these, because again, I don't know exactly, but on view rate, I think like anything above 25% is good. Okay. And I had a quick question playing off of what Blake was asking you, or someone asked you about, or I think it was Omar, about the um, Facebook, uh, the Facebook titles. I've been yeah. running for six months now, probably on the title underneath the video ads. I've been putting like our tagline, like the future of eye exams is here because mm -hmm. that's all I could fit. But I was, I'm thinking maybe now I should off of what you just said. I should, I should switch that to like my key. The first phrase I put in the, in the title, in the top copy was, you know, increase optical sales. And so I'm thinking yeah. maybe that would be a better one next to the learn more button, increase optical sales instead of our tagline. Test them. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. very, when you run just like image one, headline one, image two, headline two. You know what I mean? And then you just make the variations and you just sort them by click through rate, cost per result. You just go through a couple of those different sequences once enough impressions have been delivered. Delivered, It's very clear which variables are making the impact. So that's, that's what I would recommend. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Good to see you. Enjoy the weather out there. It's not quite the same here in Boston. Thanks, Bob. Um, wow, we just got through all of that in the chat. There were um, a couple submitted in advance. Gemma, mm -hmm. I want to get you on because this is your first pre-submitted question. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and ask it live? Just unmuted you. Hi, Chris. Hi, Megan. Long time listener. <laughs> um, my question is, how do you each define demand generation marketing? And why does it seem like everyone has their own definition of what they think demand gen is? Mm -hmm. I talked about this on a podcast recently. I had never, I had never said this before. Um, but I believe that the way that demand generation is defined right now across the board is ads and marketing ops put together. And I think that definition is wrong. I think that definition is no longer, no longer relevant. And that's what, but that's what most people look at. And I believe that the future of a demand generation marketer must include paid ads and organic content and ability to influence creative and pipeline 
you know, pipeline analysis and optimization and looking at the beginning stages of the funnel and figuring out where to optimize those things. Like that's a demand generation marketer to me, covering the entire set of comms from thought leadership all the way down and then looking at the funnel of conversion all the way to SQO, I think is a good place. Obviously you're going to look at revenue, but the immediate, the immediate places would be to ask sales qualified opportunity. And that's what I would look at for a, for a demand generation marketer, because the people like brand drives a lot of demand. And the fact that those two are split together, I actually talked with a company today and they were trying to put, they, the CMO was asking me for help on their org chart. And there was like brand and thought leadership over here. And then like VP of demand over here. And I'm like, why doesn't one person own that function? Why isn't one person in charge of both demand and thought leadership and comms? Because then you have a, a complete, for some reason they've split off, like corporate comms, another thing, like investor relations, analyst relations, different stuff like that, like corporate marketing, go put that stuff somewhere else because it doesn't, re doesn't really make an impact on this stuff. But the, uh, the other two together, having those two pieces at the, in the same function it's critically important because you can take learnings from organic and you can run them on paid and you can take stuff from paid and you can run an organic. And so um, I've been thinking about that. Some companies have rolled it up into a reven VP of revenue marketing role, which I think is smart. Um, so that's the way that I see it. I feel like a lot of demand generation marketers are put in a box where they can't do all the things that would actually drive demand. And why that's good. Um, Cause I trust your judgment. And why do you think people get the definition so wrong? Is it just like a lot of noise where there's confusion on what like demand gen is in each specific organization? Mm. Or, um, you know, what, what is it? Um, Probably the way things have been done. It's yeah, it's the it's the way things have been done. It's um, smaller companies adopting org structures from larger companies that have segmented and segmented and segmented roles and specialized and specialized. And so the, it's probably just some natural um, behavior that happens there. Um, but if you're actually in it, and you actually owned more multiple of those functions, you would realize that having oversight over or at least some type of involvement in multiple parts of that mix would ultimately influence the overall demand. And so um, the, the easiest one is when brand, aka like brand marketing, thought leadership type of stuff is not in the same uh, group as demand. When those two are split out, it's an obvious signal that I think the company's over-specialized because those functions need to work together. Interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, that was a great question. It was, and I'm with Jess on this. She called it out in the chat, but it's more and more, it's really just marketing. Like, yeah, Jess. <laughs> like, if, yeah. It really is. When you can all of it. That stuff, it's just marketing. You, you, <laughs> you can't do it well without all of it. Uh, exactly. Uh, good one, Gemma. Nice debut question. Well done. I have, um, a couple more like scenarios submitted in advance, um, mm. but I don't quite see them on. And I just did a call out in the chat. If um, there's any of you guys here that want to come on live before the end of the show, but why don't I get into uh, one of the ones or did you want to tackle the last? Um, I, think, I think there were, no, let's go ahead. There's questions submitted. Let's cover those. Cool. Um, so uh Ariani, who comes quite a bit, looks like she's not quite on tonight. She is putting together a webinar um, that's targeting um, IT personas in the banking and credit union space um, in Tennessee, sort of south, uh, southern U.S. region, and she's trying to figure out the best way to promote it. Um, topic is very specific, and it's only going to interest um, a subset of prospects within the banking space. They are working with a partner. Um, and the partner has mentioned their main goal is to obtain leads in quotes. I know how you feel about this. <laughs> so, uh, curious to learn more about how you would promote this type of webinar and how you would set expectations, uh, with the partner given this particular scenario. Yeah. So, um, it depends on what the actual content of the webinar is. If the webinar is, you know, how to get started with our product in 15 minutes, then maybe you got some leads there. If the webinar has nothing to do with your product about the trend in 
the banking and credit union about something that doesn't have anything to do with your product, then I think you're going to piss people off if you start cold calling them after they come to your webinar. They're probably not going to show up to your next one. That's for sure. Um, I give the example a lot. I think a lot of people on here will get it. And a lot of people listening afterwards would get it too. If you showed up here on episode one of Demand Gen Live, if Matthew showed up on episode one, which he was here for, and then the next day he got nine cold calls from somebody on my team about whether or not they would want to work with us, I got to believe that he wouldn't be back here anymore if that happened on every single episode, every single time. So I think people, again, just need to be they need to either be in help mode or transactional mode or marketing mode or sales mode, however you want to look at it. But like, it's just, it's just when you're, when you consistently do things, when you expect something back from somebody, you're going to lose. And so, um, so, but excluding that little caveat here, um, how are you going to get people to sign up? Like it banking credit union, Southeastern United States, this is a LinkedIn, a LinkedIn lead gen ad to sign up for the webinar, integrate the lead form with your marketing automation system and push it. Um, if you can, you can integrate the marketing automation system with the webinar platform and they fill out the form, they go into marketing automation, they go into the webinar platform, they get signed up, they get the registration email, it drops it on their calendar and you go from there. Um, so that's, that's what I would, that's what I would do. And I would test a lot of different variations of the of the creative, because if you're doing a webinar and you're running it on LinkedIn, you can pay anywhere from 20 to $500, depending on how good your creative and your messaging is to get someone to sign up and how good the targeting is. So um, if they're high value accounts, there's not a lot of people here. You could probably have a small audience and spend a little bit more on, on creative variation to try and get people to sign up. That's what I would do. And then you can also supplement it with SDR outreach. SDRs to, to invite people. Um, could work too. Really had a suggestion, um, put a sign up link on their homepage. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that this, it's a specific audience, right? Like how many people in the IT banking credit union in the Southeastern United States are going to come to their website? What percentage of the people that come to their website are going to be on there to see that it's probably less than probably really small. And so the, if using your website, when not a lot of the traffic is predominantly is interested, sometimes can be a miss, just something to think about, but um, there are ways to, to do stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. I have another, another story. Some people want more leads. You ready for this one? Oh man, <laughs> it, should be a, it should be a doozy. Our sales reps want more leads, but the CEO is a believer that uh, batch and blast SDR cadences don't work um, for the audience. Um, they don't work at all. Let's just put it like, it's not for the audience. They just don't work at all. Um, sounds like CEO is in the right head space, which is, that's a positive. Um, some additional folks at the company, um, however, want to put an MQL goal in place. They want to give um, this marketer additional headcount, well, one to two folks. Um, the current team is structured to support paid partnerships, brand, influencer, social. Um, influencers big in their space. Um, they don't gate content. Um, they want to avoid sending content downloads to the sales team. Um, so uh, he was considering hiring a strategic business development person and a marketing specialist um, who could support a marketing specialist who could support the biz dev person um, to put on uh, intimate events, potentially direct mail. It would basically be outbound sales, but this marketer would manage them. They don't really see any other way out of this with the aggressive goals and given the current state of the team, um, other than um, telling sales to hire more SDRs. So he's curious what you think about his, his thought of those types of positions for the additional headcount that that they're offering. Um, Do you get all that? In ge in general, I'm just like a little bit confused on the situation. Like it doesn't necessarily make sense to me. Um, Basically, so, this bigger MQL we, goal, and that they're they're he's getting offered additional headcount, and he's trying to figure out: can I use that to do it, or should I just tell sales to hire more SDRs? The, the short answer here is when you have aggressive goals and you do the wrong things, you don't hit the goals anyway. Like that's the take home answer. And so when people are in short-term behavior mode, 
all they do is they spend more money and they get the same result out because it's not, and they might get a marginal increase and their CAC goes up and it doesn't actually make an impact because you're doing the wrong behaviors. And so that's my, that's my initial pushback on, on just this type of stuff, but um, no content downloads allowed. Like I would want to know what's the diff definition of an MQL. That's one thing that I would like to know. And then it's just like, if you, if you, if the outcome is that you need more MQLs or whatever, like, I'm not sure how we end up at like having a partnership headcount and a biz dev person, which is essentially like an extension of a sales team um, in marketing to facilitate that. Like you might as well just go, go give that to sales or get on the MQL hamster wheel and generate MQLs that don't close. Like, so those are, those are some initial thoughts, but we go through this with people. Sometimes here's an example of what happens. Like everything's going great. We've been working for a cut with a customer for six months. Their CAC is going down. Their qualified pipelines going up. And then what? There's a position change or a leadership change or someone comes in here and they're like, Hey, I just came from, you know, blah, blah, blah company. I came from Marketo and I'm on the MQL game and I just want a billion MQLs and I don't care how much your stuff is working. We're going to shut all that shit off and we're going to get on the MQL hamster wheel. And that's what they say. And so, and when we get into that situation, I go through a little bit of a, of a process. Step one, try and understand what they're, what they're trying to actually accomplish and understand if this is, if there's a different way to do it. And they just assume that marketing is the only way to get email addresses for them to do outbound sales. So that's step one, just trying to understand and see if there's a way to redirect them. A place with sophisticated companies, I redirect them to a place like Sixth Sense or Intent Data. I'm just like, go do that. Like, let us do marketing. Marketing's working. Like, just basically just find a different avenue for them to accomplish the same outcome is one. Step two is if they don't want to do that, then I try and run both of them in parallel. I'm like, okay, so for a period of time, for 90 days, we are going to do both of these things. We're going to run 50% of the stuff that we're doing, and we're going to run 50% of the way that you want. And then after 90 days, we're going to track how many leads we got but more importantly, how many sales qualified opportunities and how much it costs us for each of those opportunities between the two groups. And then we can make, and we'll set win criteria and we'll make a decision after 90 days about which strategy works better. And we'll go from there. Almost anyone that's dealing with an MQL target should do that and then compare them. Um, step, step three, or, you know, option three, if we're kind of like, we're falling back every single time, um, option three would be to concede and do whatever they want to do, whether it's run content downloads on LinkedIn with $100,000 a month, or whether it's hire these two people to do sales, but put them under marketing um, to do what they want and then, me and then measure it over time and see whether it's working or whether it's not and, and make an assessment after that. And step four, if we we're working with a company or if you're the employee, the last step is to, uh, like we fire our customers every once in a while, or you could resign. Like those are the, those are the options. Right. And so, um, that's a, like, we've done that with companies before. I'm not here to, to have someone tell me what to do and do stuff that doesn't work. And so that they can get a hundred or a thousand, uh, MQLs from, from LinkedIn, you can go hire somebody else for 25% of the cost of, of us. If you want to do that, be my guest. And so, um, those are sort of the, the different things. Now, now that I went through that step, which might be helpful, let's talk about this. If you could, Megan, just remind me on the, um, the two people and let's just like analyze that specific sh suggestion. Yeah. So he was thinking if he had two additional headcount, um, he would hire a strategic business development person along with a marketing specialist. The marketing specialist would specifically support the biz dev person and they would work together and they would basically put on, like he's suggesting that their initial focus would be um, some small intimate events, thinking about a direct mail strategy, but basically they would team up and they would deploy those types of, of efforts. He acknowledges though that it's he's essentially like having some sales headcount under marketing, but those are the two he called out or she. Yeah. Um... I mean, I don't, I, I don't personally think that's the right move. Um, so my, 
I guess my suggestion moving forward would be get more clear because I just don't have this data and you're not live. Get more clear on what an MQL means. If an MQL means a high intent lead that's going to close, then you have to figure out whether you're two additional headcount and all of their expenses to run direct mail and put on these events and different stuff like that is even going to get you to that target because running, you know, strategic events with, ex with thoughtful direct mail that ma actually makes an impact is going to be expensive and it's not going to be a super high volume of leads. And so if you need to go from 50 leads to 500, this stuff is not going to get you there. So that's another thing. So get clear with your company on what an MQL actually means and then assess what the gap is and then my first suggestion would be to figure out if you can instead of adding resources that most likely when this experiment will, will fails you'll need to either let go or move them into a different department which is not a good move and not a good look for a company um so if you look at for if you can do it a different way without bringing on headcount because if the experiment fails you're going to end up letting those people go it's my two cents that one gets me fired up. I hate this. I hate situations like that. Matt, they can come back next week if they have a follow up question. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, and the I, I think we we actually got a question that kind of inspired the third agenda item. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you so want let's, me to kind of tee it up for you. Um, let's do, do it. No, let's go through it. Yeah. All right. So the question stated, um, the Re Refine Labs philosophy works really well for driving new logo business, but how do you approach customer expansion, AKA land and expand, um, or customer marketing? Mm -hmm. um, marketing automation platforms such as HubSpot only track the initial contact creation source and apply that to everything moving forward. So that doesn't seem like the ideal way to track future opportunities, um, but really thinking about you know taking sort of demand gen principles and, and how can those be applied to customer revenue expansion? Mm -hmm. there's, two, there's two components of this question. The first one is, is attribution and tracking because they're an existing customer. It's gonna be, it's gonna be hard um, to know what actually moved the needle. And so, um, that one's hard. So before, if you're doing any of this stuff in marketing, you need to first clear the deck with your company that it's not going to be clear. Nobody's going to come and ask for a demo when they want an upsell. They're going to talk to the rep or the CSM that they already know. And so the, the attribution stuff, you need to have an idea about whether or not it's working. You need to use your own channel level metrics to understand. But if the company expects you to have like leads, like a net new business coming from, from this type of marketing, then it's probably not, it's probably a losing game. Um, so that's step one. But in terms of tracking, a couple of the things that you could do, if you had a very large customer base, you could segment off a specific part of that customer base. Like let's pretend that you have four industries and one of them is um, healthcare manufacturing. And so inside of that healthcare manufacturing space, you got 500 customers. And so you could take those 500 accounts and then you could start running LinkedIn ads. And if you had a tool, you could do it on Facebook, you know, Facebook and Instagram, and you could run direct mail or any other executions that you wanted to do. And then I would just tag those accounts in HubSpot as whatever, or whatever you want to do as tier one, or we you know s some property that says, Hey, I targeted these people during these specific timeframes. And then I would look at did upsell opportunities open up within a specific window of time after I did that, which is probably for complex sales, somewhere between three and six months. It's probably not a like direct response type of deal for some expensive products. And so I would set a window of time um, that looks at that. And then basically if an opportunity gets created with the account, you can set automation where it's like an opportunity was created. They were tagged with this thing. Send me an email, send me a notification, do this, tag it with this. You can build the automation however you want. And so that's how I would, that's how I would track it. Um, it's just at the, at the account level, looking at opportunities generated, not necessarily the, the source of that opportunity. If you were doing things that are more easily measurable events, on-demand demos, um, direct response, email, like direct mail, there are a lot of things you can measure very clearly. And so 
you could have those touch points and try and quantify influence or different things like that as well. Um, now on the ex on the execution side, you can use all of the principles that we use because our the, the demand gen strategy is a communication strategy. A communication strategy that's you that uses business data to know whether or not it's effective. That's it. So you could use the exact same strategies to communicate with your customers about the you know feature of a new product that they don't have you know they're not using or this new feature that you released in your enterprise package but they're only on pro or um put together in a thought leadership event about the new thing talking with three people that talked about the category of why the healthcare company should think about that part of the product and or different things i'm trying to keep the examples general here and so you can use all of the exact same strategies the challenge is that usually the impact will be typically lower unless you have a massive land and expand strategy um, and the tracking will be more difficult, but you, you could use almost the exact same stuff. Just keeping in mind, Hey, these people are already customers. What I can add from a customer success standpoint is the best way to upsell your customers or expand their revenue is to deliver on the original promise that you had when you brought them on mm -hmm. um, and actually drive successful outcomes for them. Um, that works wonders. More yep. revenue always follows. <laughs> yep. And so for like, a, for most of my career, I have been focused on net new business for a couple of different reasons. The first one is that marketing is the best way to get new customers today. And the and businesses, whether I was an employee or whether the companies that we work for or my com company right now, marketing is the best way to get new customers in the most cost efficient way possible with the most scale. And if your product actually does what it what you said it was during the sales process, and they are successful and they bought two units, and then they are successful, and they have the potential to buy 50, then you actually shouldn't need to do a lot of marketing. You can do customer success, brand and thought leadership over the top. One of the most interesting things that happens to me is that I put out content every day and my customers enjoy it. Like just because they're your customer doesn't mean that they don't like your content. Like I put out content every day and I get great comments from the CMO of the company or the head of sales or even the CEO definitely probably increases retention, definitely increases buy-in to our strategy, definitely increases adoption at the executive level. And so like an easy way to know whether or not your content strategy is truly valuable is whether or not your customers enjoy it. Because if your customers enjoy it, like maybe it is built for net new business. Like ours is just built, it honestly doesn't matter. Like, yeah, our strategy is built to attract people that aren't using us right now. But a lot of our customers... A lot of the things that I talk about here help our customers too. And so um, I think that's a, a mindset shift for the people that are thinking about thought leadership is to as a litmus test about whether or not when you put on a thought leadership web webinar, whether or not your customers show up. I think that's spot on and events too. Like events can be really powerful for customers and also prospects. Mm -hmm. All right. How we do? Nine on the nose. We did good. We're tapped out of questions. Um, that was a great. That was a great last segment. You want to? You want to close us out with some closing thoughts? Um, yeah. Love, love seeing you all here. Um, hope you attend the uh, the event I'm doing with Dave. We do have our one year anniversary coming up, not next week, but the following. So, um, we'll have one more kind of like regular demand gen live, but then we're entering the last week of March or the first week of April, whatever week it falls. And we're going to have some serious parties over here, celebration, live webinars for the UK, all those different things. And so, um, and also we're, um, we're going to try and like continue to up the content game. And so, um, the events that we've been doing with Udi and Dave and trying to get Gatano in the mix and some other people, um, amping up the the production cadence on the podcast for people. And so if you have any other, and then we're also going to think about doing a couple other segments on specifically that are built for different channels. And so that's sort of cooking here that would cover different topics outside of B2B SaaS. And so, um, yeah, 
always appreciate you. Hope you have a great rest of your week and uh, hope to see you back soon. See you next week, guys. Bye.